My name is Dr. Jeff Donovan. I'm a dermatologist in Vancouver. It's my privilege to be able to speak to you today about a rare group of conditions known as the scarring alopecias. These conditions go by names such as lichen plano pilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia, folliculitis decalvans, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia. There's several conditions that form the group of conditions that we refer to as scarring alopecias. In the general population, these conditions are relatively rare. In my practice, however, I see a very large number of patients with scarring alopecias. What unites all of these scarring alopecias is the formation of scar tissue under the scalp. And that's why they're referred to as the scarring alopecias. Scarring referring to this development of scar tissue and alopecia referring to hair loss. The formation of scar tissue under the scalp leads to the destruction of the hair follicles such that the hair is unable to regrow. And the reason patients seek treatment is to try to stop this condition from getting worse. But generally, regrowth isn't possible. And I look forward to the opportunity today to review with you at a very basic, fundamental level what is known about the cause of these scarring alopecias. And I thank you very much for listening, and I do hope that you will enjoy this lecture presentation. I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. This lecture is purely educational. I would like to add that it's very important that anyone with scarring alopecia seek medical advice about their appropriate treatment and that any information obtained in this lecture should be viewed as educational and individuals should not act on anything as medical advice. So how do we go about determining the cause of a scarring alopecia? Well, certainly there are many ways that one can go about doing that. Traditionally, in medicine, there has been two main methods. The first being asking questions to patients. And the second being looking at tissue under the microscope. And that is tissue affected by the particular condition in question. Let's take a closer look at these in turn. Asking patients questions has been the way that medicine has addressed many different diseases or health issues throughout time. For example, it's not uncommon for patients to be given surveys in the waiting room. These detailed questionnaires are given with the hope to elucidate information as to the cause of a condition. For example, you might imagine that if a questionnaire is given to patients with a hair loss condition, and it's discovered that the vast majority of patients that are filling out the questionnaire have been recently started on aspirin, then one might surmise that aspirin has some role in that particular hair loss condition. Or if people filling out the survey all indicate that their hobbies include gardening, then one might ask the question as to whether gardening has a role in that particular hair loss condition. Now these two examples that I've given are fictitious, and it's rarely that easy and rarely that direct. But these are how surveys and basic epidemiologic studies are designed in the hopes to learn more about the cause of a specific medical condition. Of course, one can look under the microscope, as I mentioned. So one can obtain a scalp biopsy or a piece of tissue from the scalp and process that in a very specific way and look under the microscope. And the hopes by looking at the microscopic level is that there can be information as to what might have initially caused this condition. Some diseases in medicine, when one looks under the microscope, one can see infectious particles, or one can see actual bacteria, or 
other evidence as to what the cause of a condition might be. Unfortunately for hair loss conditions, it's usually not so helpful. One can often diagnose a hair disease by obtaining a biopsy. So one can determine that this is lichen plano pilaris as the cause of the scarring alopecia, or this is folliculitis decalvans, or this patient has genetic hair loss. But usually using the microscope to determine the actual cause doesn't take us very far. For example, if I was to obtain a biopsy from a patient with lichen plano pilaris and I was to obtain a biopsy from a patient with frontal fibrosing alopecia, and I was to give these slides to a pathologist to look under the microscope, they might not be able to tell these conditions apart under the microscope. However, to the clinician, for example, when I'm looking at the scalp of a patient with frontal fibrosing alopecia or lichen plano pilaris, I can generally tell them apart quite readily. They have very different clinical features, yet the biopsies are very similar. So clearly using specimens or using tissue as part of a microscopic study doesn't take us very far when we're trying to determine the cause of a specific condition. So asking questions and looking under the microscope are certainly helpful, but they're not enough. And because it's not enough, this has subsequently taken us into a new modern era where we need to look at the changes inside of cells. Looking at the DNA, looking at the RNA, looking at the protein. And now, as we'll outline today, we've entered an entirely new era where we're now looking at the lipids or fats that make up a cell in order to gain a better understanding of why a condition might have occurred in the first place. And so we've entered this entirely new era of genomics where we look at genes or proteomics where we look at proteins and now lipidomics where we look at the lipids inside of cells. And the hope with these types of modern technologies is that we'll have a better understanding of what might have caused a specific condition in the first place. But before we take a closer look at what might be causing these scarring alopecias, I'd like to introduce you to some key vocabulary. These are some key terms that you'll need as we go about taking a closer look at what causes these conditions. This vocabulary that I'll introduce you to isn't difficult, but there's some very key terms that you'll need as you begin to speak the language of scarring alopecias. The first term I'd like to introduce you to is the hair shaft. In this particular diagram, the hair shaft is shown in orange. And so this would be a cartoon or a schematic diagram of someone with orange colored hair. If you reach up and touch your own hair, you're feeling the hair shaft. And in fact, there's about 100,000 of these structures on your scalps. The hair shaft is a non-living structure for most of it. It's made up of keratin. And the goal of the hair follicle is to produce this hair shaft. And that region at the bottom, shown here in blue, is responsible for producing or manufacturing this hair shaft. And of course, the reason that we are all listening to this today is because these hair loss conditions lead to a reduction in hair shafts on the scalp. The second term I'd like to introduce you to is called the bulge. This is a very important term 
when it comes to understanding the cause of scarring alopecias. Scarring alopecias affect the bulge region of the hair follicle. Now hair follicles are often thought of as a tube that this hair shaft keratin structure emerges from this tube. But years ago it was recognized that the hair follicle is not a tube. It's not a straight cylinder. But rather, as we can see here in this diagram, there is an outpouching of the hair follicle about two-thirds of the way up. And this outpouching is called the bulge. And the presence of the bulge has been known by histologists for years and years, but it wasn't known why there's this outpoaching. The bulge area is a key area because it's now understood that this bulge area is where the stem cells of the hair follicle reside. And it was in the 1990s that Dr. George Cozzarellas and the group he was working with showed that the stem cells of the hair follicle are specifically located in this hair follicle bulge region. And these yellow dots show the stem cells. These stem cells are extremely important. If we take one of these yellow dots, we have the ability to produce multiple hair follicles because hair follicles are derived from stem cells. And these stem cells are located in a very strategic location here in the bulge. They are protected from inflammation, they are protected from the environment, and the hair follicle does everything it can to protect these precious stem cells. And the important point of this presentation today is that if we lose these stem cells, we lose the ability to make a new hair. So in this particular diagram, if we lose somehow these yellow dots, these stem cells, we lose our ability to regenerate a new hair follicle. So we've talked about the hair shaft, We've talked about the bulge. We've talked about the third term being the stem cells that live in the bulge region. And finally, we come to a fourth term, the sebaceous glands. Every hair follicle diagram looks similar to what I've portrayed in this picture. There's a region at the bottom of the hair follicle known as the bulb. Then there's the hair shaft, which I've described here in orange. And then there's this oil gland or sebaceous gland at the side of the diagram. And you might wonder if it's critical to the functioning of the hair follicle or is it just added to the diagram for completeness? So what is the role of the sebaceous gland? Well, the sebaceous gland produces an oily-like substance. It's a goopy substance which lubricates the hair follicle and helps it properly emerge from the skin. But this oily substance has a number of antibacterial properties which help to prevent infection. It also has a number of antioxidant properties and protects the hair follicle from reactive oxygen species. But the sebaceous gland is extremely important to the proper functioning of the hair follicle. And what we have found is that the oil gland actually plays a key role in hair follicle health and a key role in assisting the hair follicle to emerge from the skin in a proper manner. And it is these abnormalities that we will look at in the next few slides, these abnormalities of the oil gland that ultimately lead to scarring alopecias. And we'll look very closely at this concept today. So these key words, 
that you now have as part of your vocabulary will be absolutely critical as you go about explaining the cause of scarring alopecias. You now have at your disposal the term hair fiber, sebaceous gland, stem cells. And with these three terms, you can explain the cause of a scarring alopecia. Because scarring alopecia is associated with loss of sebaceous glands and loss of stem cells in the bulge. And so if someone says to you, what is the cause of scarring alopecias? You can say that there's something that leads to the destruction of stem cells and sebaceous glands. And you will have given a pretty accurate description of what we understand in the modern era. We're going to build upon this slightly, but all scarring alopecias are associated with loss of stem cells and loss of sebaceous glands. And now let's take a deeper look at some of these concepts. Let's take a look now at what's causing these scarring alopecias and we'll have an opportunity to put to use our vocabulary. We'll see quite precisely how we can use the terms stem cell, sebaceous gland, in a unified model that at least in the present day allows us to explain why scarring alopecias come about. So what are the findings, if any, among all of the scarring alopecias that point to a cause? Well, there are a number of clues that have been generated over the past several years that give us an understanding as to the cause of some of these scarring alopecias. Some of these come from asking patients questions, and some of them come from looking under the microscope, and that's where we will begin by some of the earliest observations of scarring alopecias that were obtained from examining specimens under the microscope. Let's begin then by looking at some of these first clues the first clue from some of these early observations was that most scarring alopecias have inflammation in the upper part of the hair follicle. The inflammation is not anywhere. It's not at the bottom. It's not up on the skin level. The inflammation is right here, right at the level of the bulge, right at the level where the stem cells are located. And this concept is absolutely critical to understanding why scarring alopecias lead to permanent hair loss. This inflammation, located here at the level of the bulge, destroys hair follicle stem cells. It destroys these yellow dots as shown here in this schematic diagram. And when these stem cells are destroyed, or when these yellow dots are destroyed, that hair follicle loses the ability to regenerate and patients lose the ability to regrow back their hair. This is an extremely important concept. In some hair loss conditions like alopecia areata, which I've shown on the right side of this slide, stem cells are not destroyed. And some listeners might be aware of alopecia areata as a hair loss condition. About 2% of the world is affected by alopecia areata. In this particular condition, individuals develop patches of hair loss, but the important thing is, is that the hair can grow back. Sometimes it can grow back spontaneously, sometimes it can grow back with treatment. But the important concept is that the hair follicle stem cells are not destroyed, and because of this, the hair follicle has the potential to regenerate. In scarring alopecias, just to reiterate the concept again, these stem cells are destroyed. The inflammation targets this level at the bulge and this level where the stem cells are located. And this leads to destruction of hair follicle stem cells and the hair follicle then loses the ability to regenerate a new hair. 
So all scarring alopecias are associated with destruction of these hair follicle stem cells. And whether we're talking about the scarring alopecia CCCA shown on the left, which is central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, a common scarring alopecia in black women, or lichen plano pilaria shown in the middle, or pseudopalata of Brock shown on the right side. These are three different scarring alopecias, but all share in common this destruction of hair follicle stem cells, and all share in common this clinical observation that hair regrowth does not tend to occur. In all three of these conditions, these hair follicle stem cells have been destroyed, and this results directly in the inability to regenerate a new hair. And from the patient's perspective, and from my perspective in the clinic, the inability to regrow hair for the vast majority of patients with these conditions. And the goal of treatment is to stop the condition from getting worse, to shut off the inflammation, and prevent any further destruction of hair follicle stem cells. So to review again, the first clue as to the cause of these scarring alopecias was the observation that inflammation in the bulge region was common. And we now understand that this inflammation leads to destruction of hair follicle stem cells. The second clue came from looking at the oil glands, which we are terming the sebaceous glands. And interestingly, all scarring alopecias are associated with a loss or reduction of oil glands. And so this diagram on the left is in fact not the most accurate depiction of scarring alopecias. Rather, the diagram on the right is much more accurate. In the diagram on the right, the stem cells are removed. Those little yellow dots are removed. The oil gland is removed. It's no longer flapping at the side of the diagram, as you can see on the left. And we can again see the inflammation in the upper part of the hair follicle. And these three changes are absolutely critical and are directly responsible for the changes we see in scarring alopecias. And so scarring alopecias have loss of the sebaceous gland, loss of the stem cells, and inflammation in the upper part of the hair follicle. And so this second observation, the second clue, was also extremely important in elucidating the cause of these conditions, and that is that all scarring alopecias are associated with loss of the sebaceous gland. But is loss of the sebaceous glands really that important? Is it just a coincidence that we see them disappearing in scarring alopecias? Or is it in fact a fundamental observation and a fundamental requirement for the processes that lead to scarring alopecias? Well, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my colleague, Dr. Kurt Sten. Dr. Sten has done absolutely pioneering work looking at the role of the sebaceous gland. And his work showed that the sebaceous gland is needed for normal hair follicle functioning. And his work showed that abnormalities of the sebaceous gland contribute to scarring alopecias. I'd like to share with you some of Dr. Sten's pioneering work from the 1990s, which moved this concept of the role of the sebaceous gland forward. So in order to study if oil glands are important, one needs a model. One needs a model either in the lab or in the clinic, some means of studying this with greater precision and greater care. And Dr. Sten used a mouse model. And this key model 
was called the Acebia mouse. This mouse has mutations in the oil glands such that an oily substance is still produced, but the oil is abnormal. And what Dr. Sten observed in these mice with abnormal sebaceous glands was that scarring alopecia developed. And so Dr. Sten was able to show quite effectively that Yes, loss of the sebaceous glands is absolutely critical for the development of scarring alopecia. And these mouse models showed us that these mutations in the oil glands led to hair follicles that were scarred. The hair follicles were not able to emerge from the skin of these mice, they became trapped. In fact, they became elongated and moved deeper and deeper into the skin until they burst open and developed inflammation. And this ultimately led to a scarring process in these hair follicles. And so these early studies from Dr. Sten really taught the world that sebaceous glands indeed have a very key role in scarring alopecia. So it's now understood that these changes that come about from mutations in the oil glands lead to abnormal hair follicles. And that in normal situations, this oily substance produced by the oil glands has a key role in hair follicle health, a key role in hair follicle cycling, and in hair follicle biology. And these sebaceous glands produce the oil to help the hair follicle emerge from the skin properly. And so loss of these sebaceous glands is now understood to have a key role in scarring alopecias. And so is it relevant to human scarring alopecia? Absolutely. Loss of sebaceous glands is a key feature of scarring alopecia. In fact, some of the earliest changes that we see in scarring alopecias occur in these oil glands. If you take a patient before they are aware that they have a scarring alopecia and you perform a biopsy, you will see a reduction in the oil glands. It's one of the earliest changes in scarring alopecias before it even becomes clinically evident. In addition, if you take a biopsy and you see a massive reduction in oil glands in anybody, this is a very good indication that what this patient has is a scarring alopecia. And so these changes in the oil glands are some of the earliest and most fundamental changes in scarring alopecia. So how does all this happen? We've seen that scarring alopecias are associated with loss of the sebaceous glands, inflammation, and loss of stem cells. But how does all this come about? What are some of the early events that lead to loss of the sebaceous glands, inflammation, and loss of stem cells? That's what I'd like to focus on now. Let's take a closer look at some of these specific details that trigger these pathways in scarring alopecia. The new era in understanding the cause of scarring alopecia, in my opinion, started in the last decade. And what happened in the last decade is quite remarkable. Some of the key research that has been done comes from Dr. Karnick and Dr. Mirmarani from Case Western University. And what they've shown is that some of the genes controlling lipid metabolism and fats in scarring alopecia are downregulated. These genes are altered 
particularly in the best studied of all the scarring alopecias, called lichen plano pilaris. And this information comes from comparing biopsies of patients with lichen plano pilaris compared to biopsies from patients who do not have lichen plano pilaris. And so what has come out of this research is that the lipids or the fats are changed in patients with scarring alopecia. These lipids are still produced, but they seem to be altered in a manner that they promote inflammation. These lipids are inflammatory, they are toxic to hair follicles, and they are directly responsible for the things that we observe in scarring alopecias. And so if we modify our diagram even further, we would indicate that these altered, toxic, or pro-inflammatory lipids are what is actually responsible for the observations of loss of sebaceous glands, the inflammation, and the loss of the stem cells that we see as part of scarring alopecias. And what Dr. Karnick showed is that this comes about from a reduction in a pathway known as the PPAR gamma pathway. And when hair follicles lose the ability to send signals into cells using this PPAR gamma pathway, the result is abnormal lipids. These next few slides summarize some of these key findings of Dr. Karnick's work. Dr. Karnick looked at patients without lichen plano pilaris, patients with active lichen plano pilaris, and patients with the very earliest stages of lichen plano pilaris. And let's look at a few key findings. Starting on the left in this chart, we can see that in patients without lichen plano pilaris, the biopsies did not contain inflammation. However, in those with active lichen plano pilaris, the biopsies showed rich, dense inflammation, of course, occurring at the level of the bulge. As well, in those patients without lichen plano pilaris who had biopsies, there was an abundance of rich sebaceous glands. And in those with active lichen plano pilaris, the sebaceous glands were lost. Now in early lichen plano pilaris, what was seen was some mild inflammation. And before symptoms present, before patients notice that they have a problem and before they present to the dermatologist, what is seen is this mild inflammation as well as loss of sebaceous glands. And so the key finding here is that sebaceous glands or oil glands start disappearing in the very, very earliest stages of lichen plano pilaris before these conditions become clinically evident. And when these investigators looked at genes that are different inactive lichen plano pilaris compared to individuals without lichen plano pilaris, they found that hundreds and hundreds of genes were different. Some genes were upregulated, some genes were downregulated, but the genetic profile of lichen plano pilaris was different than individuals without lichen plano pilaris in these tissue samples. It comes as no surprise that in active lichen plano pilaris, there were many genes that were upregulated, that were inflammatory genes. But what was surprising is that in the earliest stages of lichen plano pilaris, only a few genes that were inflammatory genes were upregulated. And so what this taught us is that inflammation is not a key early step in lichen plano pilaris. 
what is an early step is these changes in lipids and these changes in the fats of the hair follicle. But changes in inflammation are not the key early driving step in lichen plano pilaris. And what Dr. Carnot showed is that many lipid genes are downregulated in these early steps. And one particular lipid pathway that is downregulated is this PPAR gamma pathway, where in early lichen plano pilaris, it was downregulated some 27 fold compared to baseline in this early stage. So when we talk about scarring alopecias, it's appropriate to talk about loss of sebaceous glands, depletion of stem cells, but depletion and reduction of PPAR gamma is also appropriate. And I'd like to explain a little bit more about this PPAR gamma pathway. And this diagram shows this PPAR gamma pathway. So what are PPARs? PPARs are proteins. These are proteins that move from the cytoplasm or the outside of the cell into the nucleus or the inside of the cell. And as these proteins go into the nucleus, they send signals into the cells. And these are signals that control inflammation, control scarring, control blood sugars, and control lipid metabolism as well. And so PPAR pathways are needed for normal, healthy hair follicles. And normally there's lots of PPAR proteins around. There's lots of PPAR proteins moving into the nucleus and sending signals into hair follicles for pro appropriate functioning. And what is understood in scarring alopecias is that this pathway is reduced. These PPAR proteins are not abundant. They're not sending signals into cells as they should be. And the result is abnormal inflammation, the promotion of scarring, abnormal blood sugar control, and abnormal lipid metabolism. And so the PPAR gamma pathway is proposed to be a critical pathway in the development of scarring alopecia. But one way to prove its importance is of course to rely on a model. And you may recall when Dr. Sten set out to prove the role of sebaceous glands, he had a model and that was the model of the Asebia mouse. Well, Dr. Karnick had a model. She and her colleagues had a very unique mouse model, whereby at any time she could shut off the ability of the mouse to signal through the PPAR gamma pathway in the hair follicle environment. And what she found is that when mice were impaired in their ability to signal through PPAR gamma, they developed scarring alopecia. And in fact, it wasn't just any particular type of scarring alopecia, but rather a scarring alopecia that very closely resembled lichen plano pilaris. And so now when we take a closer look at this diagram, we see that reduced PPAR gamma leads to abnormal lipids. These lipids are inflammatory. These lipids are toxic to hair follicles. And this leads to loss of sebaceous glands, inflammation, and the loss of stem cells. And this diagram is a very useful diagram to understand some of the basic causes of scarring alopecias. And so what is understood now is that some of the earliest changes
are now thought to be due to these changes in the PPAR gamma pathway. Other pathways can, may also be altered in scarring alopecia, but the key point is that the lipids become changed as a result of alterations in these pathways. And these altered lipids are toxic to hair follicles. So how does all of this come about? What are some of the triggers that are responsible for the reduced PPAR gamma and the resultant pro-inflammatory lipids that are produced? Well, we don't know all of the answers, but it does appear that triggers like genetics and environmental triggers could be responsible. The role of genetics is controversial. We don't see a strong genetic link in most scarring alopecias. We don't see family members with lichen plano pilaris commonly. We don't see family members with frontal fibrosing alopecia commonly. Of course, there are exceptions. And certainly in my practice, there are exceptions as well. But most scarring alopecias don't have a clear genetic link. The one exception, of course, might be central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, where it may be one of the only scarring alopecias with a genetic link to date. But the role for genetics is certainly controversial, and more work needs to be done to understand the role of genetics. But what about the environment and environmental factors? Certainly there are many potential environmental triggers. There are triggers like infection. Some scarring alopecias, like folliculitis decalvans, are known to have a associated role from bacteria. The bacteria known as Staphylococcus aureus has some role in folliculitis decalvans. Trauma might be a second environmental factor that plays a role in scarring alopecia. And we know that injury to hair follicles from trauma is relevant. For example, in central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, which is a scarring alopecia occurring in black women, it's hypothesized that trauma from hairstyling practices lead to some of the findings of inflammation and scarring. Acne keloidalis is another scarring alopecia that affects the back of the scalp in some men, and trauma is also proposed to be contributory. Drugs might be a third environmental factor. And finally, some very recent data has suggested that a fourth environmental factor could also be on that list, and that environmental factor is sunscreens. It's still controversial, but one study quite interestingly has shown that sunscreens may have a role in frontal fibrosing alopecia. And so taken together, it does appear that triggers like genetics and the environment might lead to alterations in this PPAR gamma pathway and other signaling pathways that lead to pro-inflammatory lipids that then lead to loss of sebaceous glands, inflammation, and loss of stem cells. So what does the next era look like? The next era of research and investigation in scarring alopecia? Well, we saw that the first era led to an understanding that loss of sebaceous glands and loss of stem cells were key findings in all scarring alopecias. The next era that I described helped us to understand that changes in lipids were particularly relevant in scarring alopecias and changes in certain pathways, like the PPAR gamma pathway,
led to a change in the lipid composition of the hair follicle. And so what's the next era? Well, the next era, we'll see a further investigation of the role of the genetic and environmental triggers. It will be absolutely critical to pinpoint more details about these environmental triggers and to pinpoint more details about the role of genetics, if in fact there is any role. We now understand that there are many lipid changes occurring and that these fats that are being produced are indeed toxic, but what lipid changes are the most important? What lipid changes are the most toxic? And then ultimately, how can we block the hair follicle from producing these lipids? How can we block the hair follicle from losing its sebaceous glands or ultimately losing its stem cells? These are all key, key questions for the next era of research in scarring alopecia. So in conclusion, I'd like to remind you that when someone says, what is the cause of a scarring alopecia, that you have at your disposal a toolbox of answers. I've shown you today that Loss of sebaceous glands and loss of stem cells are key to all of these scarring alopecias. And that it's thought that changes in the lipid composition are fundamental to these scarring alopecias. And what happens is that there are changes in certain signaling pathways, like the PPAR gamma pathway, that leads to the production of these pro-inflammatory or toxic lipids and these lead directly to the loss of stem cells, inflammation, and scarring. And so it will be important to understand the lipids that are the most relevant in scarring alopecias. And the field of lipidomics will now allow us to move this field forward even further. And so the fields of genomics, where we look at genes, the field of proteomics, where we look at proteins, and now the field of lipidomics will allow us to have many, many more answers that ultimately will give us improved understanding of what drives these scarring alopecias. And ultimately, of course, the goal of all of this is to develop better treatments for patients with scarring alopecia. And with that, I'd like to conclude. I want to thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I hope it's been informative, and I thank you once again.